I sat down to talk with Mr. Enrique Guerra Puyol, who is studying law at the University of Central Florida. In 2013, he wrote a paper about Gödel's loophole. It refers to an internal contradiction that Gödel identified within the US Constitution and made him believe that fascist dictatorship could arise legally in America. Unfortunately, his proof was lost, and this paper attempts to reconstruct it. The history of Gödel's discovery is very peculiar, and I suggest you watch my short video about it. Also, here is a simplified statement of Gödel's incompleteness theorem for reference. So, uh, just to introduce uh, you to, I guess, my audience that's gonna watch it, um, you are trained in political science and you finished uh, Yale Law School in 1993, but uh, beginning 2011, you started to appear in articles that seem to have a lot of mathematical content. So there is a paper titled Bayesian Model of Litigation, there is uh, the Turing Test and Legal Process, and uh, finally Gödel's Loophole in 2013, which is uh, the main point of interest for today. So, um, I guess, what made you interested in kind of finding connections with strict mathematical logic and topics around that and, and law? So, what was the initial kind of motivation? By the way, thank you for the introduction. Um, great question. And I should say the answer to that question, and also why I have written some papers of a mathematical nature, though I'm a legal scholar and interested in political and constitutional questions, um, is uh, I have to shout out my friend, uh, perhaps he could be a subject of another interview, Orlando uh, Martinez Garcia. We've actually co-authored a couple of papers on the prisoner's dilemma, which is a very famous uh, game theoretical or simple mathematical model of a uh, uh, conflict situations, and um, he in particular not only generated interest, uh, my interest in um, simple mathematical models and and you know trying to have a more um, rigorous uh, study of uh, of uh, or analysis and frameworks of legal problems, um, but in particular to Kurt Gödel, um, you know he had the famous book uh, Gödel's Proof, which of course you know uh, intrigued me. And um, while it's very hard to um, it's very hard to summarize the proof, you know, I began reading, you know, sort of on my spare time in my summers, biographies of, of Kurt Goodell. And, you know, there are a number of good ones. John Dawson's mm -hmm. is probably the, uh, you know, um, uh, foremost biography I can recommend. Uh, Howell Wang, which was his, um, I believe, uh, uh, um, as a graduate student, he got to know uh, Kurt Goodell and later as equals. Um, and he is also a very impressive logician. Um, and then what happened was, as um, closer to when I wrote the paper, I picked up a copy of Rebecca Goldstein. I think this is one of the more recent uh, okay. biographies. Actually, a more recent biography came out last year. Uh, Stephen Udansky, if I pronounce correctly. Okay. Um, uh, has just published Princeton University Press a biography of uh, Goodell. But this we're talking about when I wrote the paper. And, you know, in all of these biographies, invariably, you know, anytime Goodell comes up, the anecdote of his citizenship exam. You know, okay. It's considered, it, it's almost a status of urban legend. And I will tell you some of my uh, more um, historical minded paper, though, with Goodell, it does combine a little bit of a you know, formality of, a, you know, lo logic and those things. Um, um, sometimes I'm just dissatisfied. You know, I really want to know, well, what actually happened? You know, what was the famous logical contradiction? And you may want to introduce your readers. You know, I may have jumped the gun, but um, it's something that you just hear time and time again, you know, and it's one of the reasons why I became, you know, professor scholar, you know, so I could, I could study these questions that genuinely, I am genuinely curious about. Oh, well, that's, that's, that's an amazing kind of way to approach it. Um, so, uh, let's try and structure our discussion by paralleling uh, his, you know, Gödel's original proof of incompleteness, both the statement and the proof, with how you think he approached this problem with constitution. So, um, I think uh, originally it all begins with the notion of a formal system, 
which, uh, again, we will downgrade the strict mathematical terms to something that is a bit, bit more uh, perme permeable and understandable. So we need a collection of statements together with the rules of inference. Um, how well does the US Constitution that we're talking about serve that definition? Um, by the way, excellent question, excellent way of structuring the discussion. Um, I think, you know, the Constitution is sort of a set of rules, right? And mm -hmm. different systems of logic can be seen as a set of rules. So, you know, one can analogize. Um, and so that's why I kind of, you know, I, you, you know, I should back up and say one thing. You know, in addition to my curiosity as to, okay, what is this, uh, uh, you know, reportedly a logical contradiction uh, that uh, Goodell discovered. I'm taking him at face value, right? He's a very smart person. And while I understand in some of the biographies uh, towards the end of his life, he may have been susceptible to some you know, forms of paranoia, you know, but I'm looking at the intellect of the man when he's at his intellectual prime. And so I'm saying, you know, I think uh, let's look at the constitution as a formal system. And there is kind of an analogy and what particularly, you know, kind of sparked it for me, uh, though, though, though I should say, and I should preface everything that I say, all this is conjecture on my part, you know, uh, uh, but is that um, in this formal system, right, um, uh, how do you make changes to the rules of the formal system? How do you make changes? And so uh, this is where I, I kind of like thought, um, perhaps, you know, in a constitution, we have a clause that authorizes the uh, making a formal, you know, formal method of making amendments or a, a way of changing the rules, you know. And, and this this is where it, the analogy may break down, you know, in a formal system. You know, we uh, the, the rules are the rules, you know, and um, um, uh, we're not looking to really change the rules, you know. But mm -hmm. in a sort of a constitution, you know, the, the possibility is you can change the rules. And so that's where I thought um, – uh, that, that's where I thought I would do further investigation. Right. Uh, yeah, talking about his paranoia, I think he was afraid of refri refrigerators <laughs> at some point. Yeah. But uh, there's apparently is some kind of gas that's emitted. And I also believe with his diet, you know, in fact, his ultimate cause of death was, I believe, he just refused to eat. Wow. You know, he was uh, afraid he was, again, remember this much later in his life, but I believe he was afraid of being poisoned or, uh, you know, he wanted... Um, 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 and I believe his, uh, you know, beloved wife Adele would always taste the, the, the food for him, you know, but when she passed away, he didn't have anybody to do that for him. And so, um, it does show you the human side of this great intellect. Right. I, I think, but, but by the way, may I say my most recent paper, which is now in press at the journal of law and public policy, it's called the Goodell conspiracy. <laughs> okay. It's nothing to do with what we're talking about today, but. I should make a plug for my paper because um, one of, you know, there's a lot of talk of conspiracy theories today, and this may be a product for another YouTube channel. Goodell himself believes in conspiracy theory, uh, not of a, in a political nature, but um, as to the whereabouts of some of Leibniz's writings, okay. some of Leibniz's ideas. And so um, I uh, use that sort of a historical you know, point of departure of someone as smart, right, and as brilliant. And in fact, there may have been something to the conspiracy theory based on the information Goodell had at the time when he was researching uh, you know, like these, um, uh, you know, uh, sort of have a little bit more sympathy for people who believe in other conspiracy theories. Right. I guess with that regard, uh, Bobby Fischer is also a famous kind of mm. conspiracy theorist, but I think Goodell might deserve a bit more attention uh, considering his interest in these uh, these uh, topics and maybe that will make him more famous to the wider audience one day um, but just just to stress that uh, kind of formal system situation um, okay so the statements or the sentences to be more precise of constitution uh, can be treated as sort of axioms but uh, does it really provide us with a way to construct in mathematics theorems, in law, I guess, new decisions based on maybe case study, maybe something else. Because the impression that I had is that in law, there is always a certain degree of freedom, uh, which is associated with 
uh, a judge or or somebody else to interpret laws in one way or another. So, with that regard, is this con is constitution really a strict system that uh, you know lead, can only lead us to one uh, conclusion in a particular case and nothing else, or is it a bit of a kind of oversimplification to to say that? No, no, no your intuition is actually absolutely correct, and in fact. Uh, perhaps the greatest, if you will, uh, student of legal, you know, jurisprudence or philosophy of law, HLA Hart, has a beautiful phrase to describe uh, 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 you just said, the law is open texture, you know, and this is very true of a document like the United States Constitution, which is a relatively short constitution in comparison to other world constitutions. Um, uh, so that, that, that is true. It's open texture, which does leave room for uh, a, a lot of interpretation. But the one point that I would clarify is that um, you know, regardless of its open textured nature, you know, or the room for interpretation, and, you know, some statements in the Constitution or some sentences are open to more interpretation than others, you know, certainly. Um, uh, and this is sort of a problem that bedevils all languages. But what's very interesting about the Constitution and, and law generally, I should say, is that you really have two types of rules, you know, substantive rules as to, um, for example, let's say the power of Congress to uh, regulate commerce mm -hmm. or the power of the president as commander in chief or the power of the courts, you know, to uh, resolve disputes. But also you have um, procedural rules, right, as to how those how those powers are exercised. Um, and so, for example, for Congress to regulate commerce, it would have to have Right, a majority of votes in both houses and the president's signature or sufficient votes to overwrite a veto. And so I think it's on this procedural side, you know, these procedural rules, mm -hmm. the rules of the rules, for example, the rules of how you make rules. Uh, again, to cite HLA art for those, uh, HLA art for those in um, uh, with some legal background, he refers to these as rules of recognition, you know, rules that tells us which rules are valid which rules are part of the formal system and which rules are outside of, you know, and, and not part of the system. Uh, and, and, and so um, with those points in mind, yes, I would agree. Okay. Okay, great. Um, I guess the second important notion in uh, Gödel's proof is the concept of consistency. So in logic, a formal system is consistent if there is no statement uh, such that both the statement itself and its negation can be derived within that system. Um, so I guess it's a, it's a joint question with what we've just discussed. So how, how probable is it, either theoretically or from practice, to have a statement in law that might both be true and false, in a, in a sense? <laughs> Yeah, that is actually an excellent question, and in fact, it could in itself be a subject of a, <laughs> of a serious scholarly study. Um, uh, you know, and, 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 and I think where Goodell comes into the picture and, and logic comes into the picture are those particular statements that are self-referential and that um, may contain, and in fact, a negation such as this statement is false or this sentence is false. Um, and, and, and that poses a number of, uh, you know, difficulties. And um, in the law, you know, um, um, it, it's, it's it, 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 there's really, you know, or, or in a system such as a system of rules, such as the Constitution, or do I think of a law as a whole, or a branch of substantive law, such as contracts or property, you know, there's always the possibility of inconsistent, you know, uh, rules or inconsistent laws. Um, more likely what you may have is a gap in the law. You know, you may have a, a formal, you know, a system of rules and, and um, a situation pops up that none of, none of the rules really specifically addresses, you know. So you have those two possibilities. Um, what's interesting here is that we have a single rule, right? So there's no gap and there's no inconsistency with another rule. And then that rule itself might pose, you know, a, 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 an internal contradiction. And, and so, and, and, and that's, you know, uh, again, you know, where, where, where my interest in Goodell and, and, and in making a possible conjecture as to where this contradiction might have been, or the loophole, as I call it, Goodell's yeah. loophole, um, uh, 
could there be such a rule? Could there be such a sentence, you know, uh, uh, where, w- w- where that occurs? Sure. So, so Gödel, Gödel is uh, specifically concerned with dictatorship. So uh, with that respect, which statement would, would it contradict if, if dictatorship is established? Is there a specific kind of statement in the Constitution that we can find? You know, and that is the $64 question. And let me say before I add you, I, I believe the answer to that question is yes. But before I say uh, what I think the answer to the question is, and, and a few others, uh, as I've been uh, you know, searching the literature, and I, and I realized we, uh, even before I wrote the paper, there were a number of legal blogs where people were, scholars were speculating. Um, and at the time, I wasn't too familiar with blogs, I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit, and so I wasn't able to cite uh, all of the literature. But um, um, it's very important to note that Budel is, a, you know, is um, Austrian, uh, though he was born in uh, what today is the Czech Republic. Um, and in essence, he's from Central Europe. And it's also very important to note that um, he doesn't, you know, um, immigrate to the United States permanently, you know, never to see Europe again mm-hmm. until December 1939. One of the last of those intellectuals to leave Europe during the tumult of the Second World War, one of the last ones to, to, uh, to leave. Um, and, um, um, and, and the other important note, to, this is sort of historical, right, to put all of the, of, the, of the logic and mathematics and formal analysis in context, is that practically every single country in Central Europe, most famously beginning with Germany and, you know, the rise to power, Hitler being appointed the chancellor, the Reichstag, the National Parliament um, enacting an enabling act in March of 1933, authorizing the chancellor to rule by decree. Um, But every single country um, in Central Europe somehow, you know, either ended up becoming a military dictatorship or what I call in my paper a legalistic dictatorship like in Germany, you know, where technically uh, the dictatorship was legal. You know, if you look on the, uh, the, the, the rules on the pieces of paper, right, of the Weimar Republic uh, uh, that, that perished, you know, at that moment. So what you uh, mean is yeah. that they became dictatorships without any amending done to the constitutions that were in place, right? Well, um, um, in the case of Germany, yes, for the, for the military dictatorship. So the famous one would be the, the Kingdom of Poland and, you know, uh, there was a, a famous standoff in 1926 with a great marshal and assumes power as a coup. So many of these dictatorships, you know, were military dictatorships, you know, where there was a use of force, right, to overthrow Kingdom of Yugoslavia, uh, many different examples. What's remarkable um, is that um, every single country in Central Europe, every single country, uh, you know, ultimately will, 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 during this interwar period, uh, admittedly, it was a short period of democracy because most of the countries were, you know, part of the uh, Hungarian, uh, you know, Austrian Empire. Uh, uh, so these were short-lived democracies. Uh, so I wanted to preface that, that you know, uh, this is another reason to take Budel seriously uh, because, you know, he's kind of, he's witness to history. And he's saying, you know, and while he himself is not a political person, all his biographers agrees, agree that he would like to go to coffee houses. He would like to, he would read the newspaper. You know, he, would, mm-hmm. he was aware of what was going on in his world. Um, and so um, I think the statement that he identified is in, 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 the, in the United States Constitution and in different constitutions, this is in different, located in different provisions, but um, Article 5. And Article 5 is what authorizes amendments to the Constitution. It sort of allows you to make changes to the rules or create new rules or um, uh, de- delete or remove all, you know, existing rules. And so I think that is the possibility of, um, now there's one logical uh, sort of leap you have to make here is can you change, you know, uh, this, so the amendment uh, uh, clause, the amending clause in Article 5 allows you to add new things to the Constitution change existing parts of the Constitution, right, um, and remove uh, things in the Constitution. But can you change the amendment rule itself? Can Article 5 be used to amend itself? I think that is really, um, I think this is what really, I think this is the, you know, this possibility of a, 
uh, an analogize here to the literature and self-reference, you know, uh, uh, a statement that refers to itself. Um, it, 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 I, that is my, the essence of my conjecture with regard to Goodell's loophole. Uh, right. So, so then how, how practical is that uh, observation, right? So is it conceivable that it could be applied in, a, you know, in the most uh, unbelievable situation or is it a purely theoretical result with respect to this specific U.S. Constitution example, you think? This is where it gets tricky. Um, um, Budel's own friends and witnesses to his citizenship hearing, none other than Albert Einstein, you know, and um, someone who may be known to uh, your audience, Oscar Morgenstern, who is along with Johnny Von Neumann, you know, one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, you know, they wrote a book together and created a new field of uh, game theory of games. Um, uh, they seem to think this was a kind of a far-fetched hypothetical. But I will tell you, and I, I have to go back to my paper, at the time, when I write the paper, this is pre-Donald Trump, um, at the time, you know, scholars looking at the Constitution were saying, you know, it's very hard to change the Constitution. It's very hard to make amendments. In fact, there have only been, excluding the Bill of Rights, when there was a package of 10 amendments, actually it was 12 amendments, 10 of which were ratified, in 1789 at the founding, you know, after uh, the first Congress, if you will. Um, uh, only 17 additional amendments have been ratified. Many have been proposed, you know, uh, but only a small subset have been ratified because it is difficult. Uh, procedurally, procedurally, you need super majority. It's a two step procedure and you need super majorities in both steps. Um, and so, um, um, uh, the reason why I think it's not as far-fetched and hypothetical is because scholars have very recently proposed we should make it easier to amend the Constitution. Oh. We should get rid of the second step. The second step basically consists of um, after the Congress proposes an, am an, uh, an amendment and you need two-thirds votes in both, in both houses of Congress in the United States to propose an amendment to the Constitution, which in itself is very difficult. Um, then three quarters of the state legislatures or three quarters of all of the state's meeting and state conventions, a very high number of states then must ratify three quarters of, a, of the 50 states. And so um, um, some scholars propose, let's just have, a, let's get rid of that second step. You know, let's have Congress can both propose and ratify an amendment. And what's to then to prevent why not then have a Congress uh, vote by a simple majority to propose an amendment and we keep the three quarters or reduce the state ratification to two thirds or reduce the state ratification to simple majority. I say all of these scenarios that, you know, may be far fetched, may be hypothetical to say that my conjecture is this must, this is what I believe what Goodell's concern was that the amendment clause would be, um, could be amended to make it easier to amend the Constitution. Um, I only say this because of in Germany, and to use the particular example of the Weimar Republic um, and Hitler's consolidation of power, the Weimar Constitution authorized changes to the you know, fundamental charter to the Constitution of Weimar Republic. Um, with two thirds of uh, uh, two thirds vote of the Reichstag of the national parliament, and um, any part of the constitution could be amended, and so um, uh, uh, it, you know what is far fetched is to have you know an amendment you know proposing uh, proposing you know the president in the United States the president to rule by decree that is far fetched. What is not far fetched? you know, would be an amendment to make it easier to amend the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And that is sort of independent of what Godel found, and I think that's the, that, that is the Godel, Godelian loophole. I think that's the concern, because if it's easier to amend the Constitution, then in the time of a national emergency, then one can imagine then, okay, if I need a simple majority to amend the Constitution, for example, you know, then let's give president to the uh, power to the president on a temporary basis, you know? So I think that is the concern. Amending the amendment clause, you know, to make it easier in the future uh, uh, to then amend any other part of the Constitution. I just think that given how thorough 
involved and undeniably smart Godel was, it might be very important to understand whether he believed in those practical possibilities for whatever he found to be applied out there in the world, which might explain his concern that he expressed to Einstein and Morgenstern and later to the judge foreman. Uh, I guess, I guess it could be interesting to center around that and sort of take as an assumption this understanding that Godel wouldn't uh, be wasting his time if he saw certain kind of brick walls that would prohibit this even the theoretically possible but practically uh, impossible uh, kind of amendments to, to the kind of originally democratic uh, state. Indeed. And, and I should add as a further aside, in addition to this, his Central European background, right, where he's seeing, and Austria is another interesting case, where there was a deadlock in the parliament. Um, there was a, um, this is in March of uh, 19, I, I have to double check the timing of this, but um, while Godel still lived in Vienna, in Austria, uh, there was a, a, a rail worker strike, and there was a, a um, uh, political impasse and the, the, uh, the, the speaker or the president of back then before the Anklas, before the uh, unification of Germany and Austria, the, uh, the, 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 the head or the president of the uh, Austrian parliament stepped down and that created a gap. You know, the, the, the Austrian constitution, uh, uh, you know, you didn't foresee that situation. And, um, and that's where, um, uh, th uh, that's where the Austrian uh, uh, um, uh, premier at the time, you know, stepped in, uh, sort of seized uh, power in an extra legal fashion. He was ultimately assassinated uh, in July of that year as part of this political tussle. Uh, and then, of course, all of this became moot when Germany is going to um, annex uh, Austria um, in 1938. And, and so, um, uh, but in the United States, you know, and this is before Korematsu, before the intern, you know, uh, internment of Japanese American and persons of Japanese ancestry. Um, many of the legislation enacted by Congress, you know, uh, was un, you know uh, justified as there was a national emergency, you know, the the great the, an, an economic emergency prior to the war. Then, of course, the war itself, you know, uh, um, um, when the United States uh, joins the war and. Um, and, and, and so there's a literature of this, you know, the invocation, and still to this day, you know, think of 9-11 or think of other uh, national crises where a national emergency is invoked in order to consolidate power. And so um, the, 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 at the end of the day, you know, what, what, what prevents a, a legalistic dictatorship, you know, you can't really prevent a military dictatorship, right? That's the use of force, right? Um, but to prevent a legalistic dictatorship, right, the Constitution divides power, right? Uh, uh, you have these overlapping centers of power, you know, uh, with these uh, multiple branches of government and, you know, the, the states. So you have different levels of government. Um, and so um, how would it be possible, right, for one of the branches of government, you know, to consolidate, consolidate all of its power? And, um, um, you know, even, in, you know, in an emergency. And so... I think if you could make it easier to amend the Constitution, um, then perhaps in a national emergency, maybe, you know, uh, it's, it would be possible then to have an amendment to then, to then consolidate the power. Now, all this could be very far-fetched, right? That's why I say, you know, yes, it could be very far-fetched and hypothetical, uh, but not impossible, as the example of Germany shows. Okay. Um, right. I mean, you're making a good job on guessing my questions. <laughs> And kind of uh, dis <laughs> discussing discussing them in advance. Um, okay, so so um, I could mention in the paper there are a number of other flaws in the Constitution. You know that that I consider non uh because they're non self referential, and so sort of this is like for you know, and this this goes a little bit beyond mathematics and beyond logic. Um, one problem is you know the president is commander in chief of a standing army. So you could say that opens up the possibility that he could abuse that power, you know. Um, um, another possibility is that because Congress has the power to regulate commerce and because every human activity has a commercial nexus, if you will, has some, you know, think about everything, you know, uh, we do every day, right, where we, we buy products and services or using the Internet. Everything has a commercial. So Congress could then use its you know, power to regulate commerce, you know, in, in a way. Uh, to consolidate power. Um, another 
possibility is um, the Supreme Court ruling by decree, um, this power of judicial review, and the Supreme Court erroneously, I believe, in a case called Cooper v. Aaron, said it has the last word when it interprets the Constitution. Right. That was the case involving the desegregation of the schools in um, in um, Little Rock, Arkansas, um, as per the Brown v. Board of Education famous case. But as I always tell my students, if President Eisenhower does not, um, when, the, when that case was decided, Cooper v. Aaron, President Eisenhower had already sent the 101st Airborne right. and had used physical force to integrate the uh, Little Rock Central High School. And so, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, could the Supreme Court order President Eisenhower? He did that voluntarily. The case was decided after the fact. Um, so these are all flaws, right, in which, you know, you could say the commerce power is very broad because everything affects commerce. You could say having a president as commander in chief of a standing army is very dangerous. And you could say that a Supreme Court with a unlimited, you know, power of judicial to review all our laws, you know, and in effect declare itself a super legislature. These are all admittedly potential problems with the Constitution. But to me, I don't think, um, you know, someone as a genius, right, a reticent genius, to quote John Dawson, you know, as Godel, I don't think he would be, you know, um, uh, concerned about those more obvious, you know, or those more glaring potential problems with the Constitution. I think he might be more given, you know, given his interest in formal methods and given, you know, uh, 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 his incompleteness theorems and what he's most well known for, given, in short, his interest in self-reference, you know, uh, recursion and those kind of things. Um, I, I think it's the possibility of, of amending this, the uh, provision that allows you to amend the Constitution, you know, to make it easier in the future than to make changes to the Constitution to ratify you know, potential consolidation of power. Now, this could be very far-fetched, right? That still requires two changes, right? You'd have to amend the amendment, uh, the amendment clause and then have the substantive amendment to concentrate power. So that's why I say, yes, you know, we could say, say this is hypothetical and far-fetched. But because I say there's a literature you know, where some scholars would like to make it easier to, uh, I cite the literature in my paper, uh, Godel's loophole, you know, make it easier to amend the Constitution. Some scholars I even propose getting rid of the state ratification process or or if not getting rid of the state ratification process, you know, uh, which requires three quarters of the states to ratify an amendment, um, reducing the two thirds requirement for Congress to propose an amendment to a simple majority. Mm -hmm. And so these may all be good, you know, good changes to make it easier to update and change our Constitution not have to require judicial review and those kind of things. Um, uh, but, you know, I say they may open the door to this potential Godelian danger in, in a time of a national emergency. Um, and I may be wrong about that. You know, it is complete conjecture on my part. Uh, but, um, um, Great. Uh, but I do want to distinguish, um, and I think that's the main contribution to the paper, that, you know, if we are trying to, even if I'm mistaken about my conjecture about uh, the good, Godel's loophole, um, we should be, you know, I, whatever the contradiction is, we should be thinking along Godelian lines. You know, you, you know um, um, what are problems that formal systems could potentially have, you know, um, and which of these problems might be relevant to a, 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 a system of rules, you know, legal rules, if you will, both procedural and substantive. And so um, I think that's the main contribution of the paper. Sure. Yeah, I'll make sure to to cite to the original paper because, well, you gotta refer to the to the first source to to understand uh, the kind of the more precise statements that we are discussing today. But um, there is one interesting aspect that I had no idea about, and that is there are certain statements that the amendment clause does not apply to, irregard yes. irregardless of whatever. So what are those statements and do you think that it's possible to include something into that list of statements that will kind of close that loophole from happening? By the way, that is an excellent question and I'm glad you reminded me about that because that is a point that before we conclude I did want to touch upon. Um, in, the, in the legal literature, scholarly literature on constitutional law and political science, um, these are often referred to as entrenchment. Uh, provisions or clauses of entrenchment, you know, a provision uh, um, that's so fundamental, you know, human rights, free speech, 
that we don't allow any changes to be made. And, and many European constitutions have these entrenchment clauses. And let me just say, here is where there's a um, uh, uh, divergence of opinion in the literature. Um, my position, and um, I'm, you know, as a Bayesian, I, I'm open-minded. I, I'm willing to change my position. Um, um, I believe the Godelian logic, you know, of, uh, uh, applies even to entrenchment clauses. That even a clause that uh, prohibits a change to itself or to another part of the constitution, which is what an entrenchment clause is designed to do, um, uh, would wither under this Godelian analysis, you know, of self amendment. Um, others have taken a different uh, position that, um, and I cite them in the paper. Uh, I think I think it's the more numerous group that no entrenchment insulates us from this Godelian, you know, uh, uh, possibility. And if that's the case, we have nothing to worry about. And so I'll give the specific example in the United. In my paper, I go into different type. There are different types of entrenchment clauses. Um, what's very interesting is the United States Constitution, for example, is has the more com. You know, first of all. Many constitutions um, don't have any so-called entrenchment clauses. You know, so any anything can be changed. Any part of the constitution can be changed, and so you could say those are the most worrisome. You know, on the on, on another extreme, you have some constitutions that say um, you can't amend the amendment clause. You know, which would basically effectively neutralize the rebellion loophole. Um, and then in the middle, you have the United States Constitution. That has uh, that says uh, the one entrenchment clause that continues to have legal forces. Um, you cannot change the rule of equal representation in the Senate. This is often referred to as the Virginia Compromise during the 1787 Philadelphia Constitutional Convention. Um, there was a big conflict between the large states and the small states, and the the Virginia Compromise was to base representation in the House of Representatives on population. So larger states would have large, you know, larger, more representatives in the in the in the in the Congress. But to base representation in the Senate um, on equality. So regardless of the size of your state, it's geographical or, pop, or you know population, um, every state is entitled to two senators. And this is entrenched in the United States Constitution. It cannot be changed unless all of the states agree. Uh, so yeah, it really it, technically it imposes a, un, a unanimity requirement. So it could, in theory, be changed, right? But you would need unanimous. Um, without getting into the details, when, once we have a unanimity requirement, for all practical purposes, it becomes a kind of entrenchment because a single, you know, a single dissenter can then can then uh, bring down the entire proposal. Um, and so um, where I where I speculate in, in my paper is. Um, and this is something I said, I'm open to, you know, considering the other side is, well, it's true, you can't amend, you know, you, you can't change the, the rule of equal representation in the Senate, for example, um, without unanimous consent of all the states. Um, I, I'll just conclude by saying sure. that this is where there's a genuine dis, uh, disagreement in the Constitution. Um, by the way, the first time that I've heard of an entrenchment clause the first time this was ever proposed was um, uh, the original um, 13th Amendment. Uh, so the 13th Amendment that was enacted after the Civil War is, of course, the famous amendment that uh, prohibits um, slavery and indentured servitude, um, except for reasons of uh, punishment for a crime and uh, military obligation draft and those kind of things. Um, but the original uh, uh, 13th Amendment that was proposed before the Civil War is something called the Corwin Amendment. And the Corwin Amendment, what it would have done is it would have said that um, it basically would have put slavery in the Constitution and say that the federal government could not interfere with the laws of those states in which, in which it, you know, slavery was legal, in which enslaved persons were, you know, were held against their will. And so in the original Corwin Amendment, it was not only, not only was there a, this a, a, a attempt to, um, uh, for, you know, in, uh, protect slavery in, in, in the uh, by amending the Constitution, uh, but also to make that amendment um, um, entrenched to pro to prohibit future changes okay. to 
what would have been the 13th Amendment. And so, uh, and, and this is modeled after Article 5, the rule for equal representation in the Senate. And so, and, and, and I was saying here, there is a um, uh, sharp divergence in the literature. I think there is a consensus now that the Brudelian loophole or the Brudel's loophole is the problem of self-amendment. Where there's a divergence is, um, can you protect against it? You know, can you amend the Constitution to prohibit future changes to the the way we amend the Constitution? Um, uh, currently, the Constitution, this is where we got cut off, right? Um, uh, doesn't allow us to change the Virginia Compromise, doesn't allow us to change the rule that every state, regardless of how small or how large, right, is only entitled to two, two senators. Um, and by the way, this is very interesting because this has been very highly criticized in, recently, right, by not just scholars, but many activists and people in the you know public um, as being very unrepresentative, that Wyoming, right, has the same representation in the Senate as uh, California. And, you, you know, if you look at all the small states that have very little population, you know, and um, they basically, you know, uh, uh, have a, uh, you know, disproportionate effect on power. So that's why I think this is not very hypothetical. People are very concerned about this anti-democratic aspect in the Constitution. Well, well I will leave it to one side, to one side, whether we, we could, we should have, you know, change the equal uh, suffrage rule, the two senator rule. Um, uh, because there are arguments to be made on both sides. Uh, the question is, can you change it, given that the Constitution entrenches it, given that it doesn't allow you to change it? And what I propose in the paper, and I've been considering since publishing the paper, writing a follow-up, because I, I this is where I devote the fewest space to, but it's the most important problem, uh, I, I think, now, um, is um, can you unentrench an entrenchment clause? And so just like I think the Godel loophole involves a two-step process, where you make it easier to amend the Constitution, and then you amend the Constitution to give the president or whoever dictatorial power. I think um, an entrenchment clause would involve a three-step process, you know, a Godelia process where, you know, first you amend the Constitution to uh, remove the entrenchment language, uh, you know, uh, uh, then, um, uh, uh, then you amend the Constitution um, in, in, in the direction, uh, uh, you know, with, with the actual substantive uh, change. Okay, well, let's have a population based on the Senate, you know, uh, Senate representation based on population, for example, or, or a different form of mathematical formula. Um, uh, so th that is the current debate, you know, does an entrenchment clause, you know, it, it, can it be changed even if, even if it says you cannot change, uh, change that rule. Um, and, um, you know, in the legal formalistic sense, you know, of course, it always, I think, you know, as a, as a legal realist, there will always be changes in society and, and the way we interpret rules and the way we, you know, language changes and evolve. But, you know, formal, formalistically, you know, um, can you make a change to an entrenchment clause? Um, and so I think as a three step, right? I forgot the third step. Uh, first, you say, you know, you, you know, uh, 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 you know, you, uh, you remove, uh, uh well, now, actually, now that I see, uh, now that I talk about this, so I said it could be a further paper. Um, it would probably really be the same two steps. You remove the entrenchment, and then you make the actual the actual change that you want to make. You know, um, again, leaving to one side whether that actual change would be good or bad. Um, uh, but it's 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 very fascinating, and I think this is very interesting. It's why we should take people's even their most craziest ideas um, seriously. And this is, I think, the, I think the, to me the most, um, if you will the saddest part of the paper, you know, that nobody really, would, you know, uh, took the Goodell's ideas very seriously. And I could understand the judge, right? He's pressed for time. This is a pro forma uh, back in the, uh, this time, you know, um, the citizenship exam consisted of an actual hearing before a judge. And what's very interesting is the judge was willing to break the rules in terms of allowing Einstein and Morgenstern to attend the citizenship hearing. Um, um, under the law of that time, the interview of the character witnesses and the hearing or interview of the actual applicant for citizen, you know, had to be conducted separately, you know, to avoid collusion. But in fairness to Judge Philip Foreman, you know, he had already uh, examined Einstein many years of, uh, previously and had already sworn him in as a citizen. And so when he saw Einstein was one of Godel's witnesses, he made an exception. You can all come into the room. We'll all do this quickly and informally. You know, but it's interesting. He was willing to break the rule in that respect, you know, but uh, not willing to break the informal rule. Okay, let's talk about why do you think you're the smartest man on the planet? 
why do you think there could be a constitutional, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, dictatorship? Uh, I guess it, it, it brings uh, us nicely to the first uh, question of discussing practicality. So we, Godel himself observed uh, the the breaking of laws in front of him. So so yes. maybe maybe that that practical aspect was even more kind of obvious to him uh, after that. Yes. Um, yes. And, 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 and the practical, I always say, it's always a matter of degree because I believe people, you know, uh, in Germany would have never believed that they would have become a citizenship. I believe people in Austria would have never believed, you know, that their government would have broken down, you know. And maybe there were many Poles and Yugoslavs, you know, who believe their countries would have never become dictatorships, you know. Um, and um, uh, But yet all of this was occurring during this interwar period. And so um, I should say that Godel's citizenship exam did not occur until December 1947. So, um, you know, I could see where Morgan, Stern, and Einstein, but then, of course, the war was over, you know. Uh, the outcome was decided. Uh, uh, the emergency had passed. So I could see how, from a practical perspective, we wouldn't have to worry about any of this, you know. But Goodell, who lived during the, uh, you know, in, in uh, Vienna during almost all of the, or the entire interwar period, you know, uh, he did not leave until December 1939. Uh, I, I think he was, uh, you know, I think he was more open to the possibility. I think Goodell, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Einstein left in 1933. Morgenstern also left uh, fairly early. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, 1934. They all left to the Institute of Advanced Studies you know, earlier than Goodell, and Goodell did not really arrive until January of 1940, you know, uh, to be permanent, uh, become permanent resident in the United States. And so all of these things, I think, but most importantly, Goodell's genius, you know, and Goodell's, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, knack for understanding formal systems, you know, and his creativity in his uh, study of formal systems, I think we should give him the benefit of the doubt. Right. Uh, so first of all, I can see how our discussion can sprout into a series of of uh, video lectures on on several topics. So it's very interesting to talk to you and get uh, get educated on the, these kind of exciting uh, aspects of law and uh, and their limits, as we can say. But uh, perhaps we should have started with this. Um, just, just to have a general outline of kind of exact logic that Godel followed, I, get, I think you give this towards the end of your paper. So it's, it's a five-step process according, according to your theory. Um, so the first statement uh, refers to this fact that the 19, uh, 1789 constitution without amendments is, is a finite system, right? It's, it has a finite number of sentences, which is uh, important. Then that amending statement effectively allows you to introduce or remove uh, existing statements, which kind of gives this infinite, infinite structure to the whole thing. So um, then there is then there is step three, uh, where you classify Article Five as of type two out of I guess four types that you outline in your paper. So type two means that it's not prohibit. It's not prohibiting itself, at least yeah. this is how you interpret it, but yes. it can be applied. Uh, it, it has a mending power over many, I guess, every statement except those two that we just discussed. Yes. So just maybe we can concentrate on step four. You're saying that amending power of Article 5 is self-referring and may be amended downward, right? Yes. So, so when you say amended downward, do you mean that uh, it can result in an kind of in an, in an infinite process that sort of destroys the whole uh, the whole constitution, or do you mean that there is there is theoretically a statement which allows for dictatorship to be established, and this this loophole sort of makes it legitimate through some finite number of steps? So just to concentrate on the loophole itself, kind of how how does it work exactly in a in a Godelian? Uh, structure, do you think? That's actually a fascinating question, and um, and 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 now I can see that there's. Um, you, you know, I'll answer your question by. Um, I was considering. By the way, you you, you outlined the uh, steps um, in perfect fashion. You know, there's a, a finite number of statements in the Constitution, 
or sentences, whichever your level of analysis, one of these statements or sentences or units of analysis, right, is the amendment, uh, rule changing or amendment or, uh, uh, provisions uh, statement sentence. Um, this is a particular type of sentence which itself is not entrenched to use the formal language, which itself does not prohibit changes to itself. Um, and then uh, the, the, the crucial step here, right? Uh, the fifth step is, I said, a controversial one. You know, even if it were entrenched, could you still change it? Uh, but the, uh, the, the, the fourth and crucial step here is this downward uh, 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 um, change, you know. Um, and initially, I had meant that um, um, because the amendment, first, what protects us, you know, from a legalized dictatorship is that it's just very difficult to change the Constitution. Uh, so, uh, because you need all of these uh, it's multiple steps with, uh, you know, with, with incredibly super majorities at both steps. Um, and so, uh, uh, what, what I initially meant by downward departure was simply to make it easy, remove one of the steps, or lower the thresholds to simple majorities at both steps. Then, in the case of an emergency, then the actual, you know, the dirty deed could be done. Um, but I like what you mentioned, and it was it is consistent with the spirit of the paper. With you know, my other area of study was Spanish literature, so I cite my favorite author, uh, Borges, you know, and the uh, Library of Babel, um, and this uh, you know potentially infinite library, you know, um, um, and uh, and so uh, uh, yes, that that would be the other possibility, maybe even more Bodellian than my original speculation. Uh, just making, you know, so many changes, so many additions, you know, to the Constitution where uh, it's really impossible to keep track of it all, right? This is the lesson of the Library of Babel, right? There has to be one book that contains a compendium of all the other books, you know? But then uh, how do you find that book, you know? There must be another book that refers to the, compendi the compendium of the books, uh, of all the books, you know? Uh, but then how do you find that second book that refers to the first book and then you have gone now in a downward spiral. Um, I uh, and so I, you know, I suggest that possibility, um, you know, uh, in, in the paper um, because of a, a tussle with my editors who actually wanted me to remove all the references to Borges. You know, uh, I never really fully spelled out the argument that you had just made, but I did leave it in the footnotes with my reference to Borges and the possibility of an infinite library. And but imagine, what what problems? You know, what constitution with so many yeah. provisions? You know, uh, that you can't really keep track of it all, you know. That, so, and, 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 um, and perhaps that's the true Bodellia, uh, uh, you know, uh, danger. But, sorry, and, and, and what... I should say, and I should say, yeah. perhaps, perhaps the less far-fetched one, because even though our Constitution is quite small, you know, because it is difficult to amend, and we have not had that word, you know, or simplifying amendments um, uh, to the rule uh, uh, provision, a uh, changing provision itself, if you look at the corpus of federal and state law and, you know, and let alone the corpus of federal regulations, right, you do seem to have this, what I call this expanding web of laws, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, that introduces, introduce, now this is a different problem, a problem of complexity, you know, as opposed to inconsistency, you know, and so it may require different tools and, like you say, maybe a different, uh, different video, uh, 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 but yes, I can see that a, poten a potential danger. Okay, so... Uh, I guess could be one of our final points. The what's important about Godelian proof is that it's constructive. So he's not simply stating that there will be a statement that we can neither derive that it's true or false, but given uh, a precise formal system, he actually gives us a way of mechanically constructing such a statement, right? Um, so do you provide? Uh, Kind of this potential construction that uh, that could have happened in occurred to him in his head uh, with regards to this loophole, or do you only limit yourself to this kind of theoretical uh, kind of engine that can produce such a statement? <laughs> Fair question, and, and and I will say, in what I have published, I limit myself to the theo so theoretical you know, theoretical aspect of this. Um, I've been in correspondence. I'd have to search my emails and be more than happy to, you know, forward and copy you. I have been in correspondence with, you know, in, you know, uh, uh, you know, mathematicians who, who, you know, truly understand the Godelian numbering system. Yeah. And, you know, it would be interesting, right? You know, could you actually transpose, you know, and I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't attempt to make that effort, uh, but could you actually transpose, you know, 
the actual method, the, you know, the method that Godel used and making his um, remarkable, you know, uh, 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 proving his remarkable theorems, you know, could you actually, if you number, you know, notice I attempt to lay the groundwork, um, you know, if we can, um, I, and, and I should say in my defense, one of the reasons um, I did not, you know, uh, attempt uh, to actually do, you know, uh, what you asked, um, but, but which I think might be a worthwhile exercise, if anything, just to see where it leads. Um, I say two points. There actually, um, and I, I can send you the reference. There are um, two graduate students in Germany who I believe attempt to do just this uh, with the paper. They actually try. Um, I, I will say it's beyond my ability. You might be better able to decipher their work and to assess the you know, credibility of their work. They seem very serious, you know, uh, uh, work to me. Um, but I have not taken the time to actually, you know, uh, uh, fully uh, digest and, co uh, and comprehend uh, their attempt. But I will, I will forward that to you. But by the way, now that I mentioned that, I will also forward, you'll notice in the original paper I've included Albert Einstein's um, Declaration of Intent just as a way of describing uh, the immigration process at that time. Um, I have subsequently discovered, I was able to, um, uh, you know, through uh, Freedom of Information, I was able to discover and obtain a copy of um, Goodell's citizenship, you know, the, the actual documents. Again, there's no, you know, evidence of what the contradiction is, but, you know, with his uh, passport picture and, you know, his application for citizenship declaration. So I will also send those to you because I, I discovered those, uh, you know, uh, obtained those after I had published the paper. Um, and but but to address your initial question, yeah, I, I think that's uh, you know uh, um, uh, the reason why I didn't do it is um, there is and, and this is where it becomes where we go back to where we started with the law being open to interpretation and the phrase I used open texture the HLA Hart's uh, description of how the law why the law you know language is this open texture of nature. Um, I, I think to actually attempt the Godal approach. Um, we'd have to define the unit of analysis, you know, and, 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 and my problem was that, you know, we could, we could do it at the level of sentences, you know, with the level of sentences, at least I was able, you know, we can actually do an arithmetical count because that's just punctuation, you know, uh, assuming no typographical errors, but each, many of the sentences in the original 1787 constitution, right, contain of many statements, you know, and so the most famous is article one, section eight, which has 16 separate clauses, Authorizing Congress sixteen separate substantive powers, you know, delegated powers, and so um, and many of those clauses, you know, could be further subdivided. So that would be the initial, you know, um, th that would be the initial, if you will, challenge uh, or difficulty. You know, what would what would be our unit of analysis? Um, uh, uh, you know, Godel had his numbering system. Uh, you know, he figured he figured that out. You know, for his you know assigning uh, each axiom or rule, if you will. You know, if we want to use a more legal term. You know, a, a particular Godel number, as we call it today. Um, uh, and so the question is, could you do that? You know, to a, a quote unquote formal legal system. You know, does it make sense to do that? And um, uh, because I wanted to focus on the actual conjecture, you know, you know. Um, but I think this is still a worthwhile enterprise. How did how did Godel you know come up with the you know his conclusion? Uh, so, uh, so I will send you those two things: the link to the uh, uh, to the German scholars um, who I believe attempted to do just that, um, and um, and I believe that was um, in twenty nineteen or twenty twenty. So it's very recent. Um, and um, and then the actual Godel citizenship papers that each were your primary. If you want to link to them on your on your page, sure. I mean, I, I guess it's it's a good measure of 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 a good paper that it, it, it lives on. Uh, I mean, yes. you know, it's almost 10 years since your publication, which is not that much, but considering how most papers get kind of lost in history straight after publication, I think uh, we should all thank you for kind of taking this endeavor and um, trying to discover this lost treasure of Godel's thought process that could potentially protect us from uh, one of the most, one of the worst uh, situations that uh, can happen, you know, overall. But so right now, I think we're just.